presentation presented by our House of Assessment and Evaluation. May I present Cindy Zyker. Much, Heather, and welcome to everyone. My name is Cindy Zyker with Zyker Research, and I'm the chair of the iLearn Assessment and Evaluation House. For the sake of our presenters, we ask that you mute your microphones and enter your questions in the chat, and we will try to get to them at the end, or maybe one or two integrated throughout the presentation. Tonight, we welcome an exciting panel organized by Dr. Diego Zapata Rivera, who has been leading our theme based assessment work group with Dr. Akisi as part of our house initiatives. Dr. Zapata Rivera is a distinguished presidential appointee, director of the Learning and Assessment Foundations and Innovations Center of Educational Testing Service in Princeton, New Jersey. He earned a PhD in computer science with a focus on artificial intelligence in education from the University of Saskatchewan in 2003. His research at ETS has focused on the areas of innovations for reporting and technology enhanced assessment, including work on adaptive learning and environments, game based assessments. Research interests also include Bayesian student modeling, open student models, conversation based tasks, sharing assessment, virtual community, community authoring tools, and program evaluation. Tonight, in addition to Diego, we have the honor of hearing presentations by Dr. Maddie Keener, James Lester, and Yadamad Rahimi. Dr. Keener is director of the Cognitive and Learning Sciences Group in the Center for Learning and Assessment Foundations and Innovation Center at ETS. He studies learner behaviors captured in dialogue log files, digital log files by technology enhanced assessment items, extended digital performance tasks, and interactive simulations collaborates with colleagues to generate cognitive models of these process data traces, he uses cognitive science research and theory to inform the design of interactive tasks, thus enhance what, we, what can be inferred from the resulting process data. Her work and the work of her team has been applied to the National Assessment of Educational Progress. She is Executive Director of the NAEP Survey Assessment Innovations Lab, a research arm of NAEP, with multiple projects exploring foundational research questions, design principles, and potential technological innovations, goal of informing and enhancing the future of NAEP, large scale assessment more broadly. Dr. James Lester is Distinguished University Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Center of Educational Informatics at North Carolina State University. Research centers on transforming education with artificial intelligence. Current work ranges from adaptive learning environments and multimodal learning tasks to intelligent game-based learning environments, computational models of interactive, narrative, and effective computing. He is the author of more than 200 publications, primarily in the area of AI technologies for education. AI augmented learning environments he and his team create have been used by thousands of K-12 students around the globe. He is a fellow of the Association of the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, he has received funding from many foundations. He has served as editor in chief of the International Journal of Artificial Intelligence and Education and on the 2020 National Educational Technology Plan Technical Working Group for the U.S. Department of Ed. Finally, we have Dr. Siyam. I say it today. I practiced it too. Dr. Siyadamid Rahimi, who is an assistant professor of educational technology in the School of Teaching and Learning at the University of Florida. Dr. Rahimi's research focuses on assessing and fostering students' 21st century skills, focusing on creativity and STEM-related knowledge acquisition, focusing on physics understanding. Toward that end, Dr. Rahimi designs, develops, and evaluates immersive learning environments, including educational games, equipped with stealth assessments, educational data mining, and learning analytics models. These learning environments can diagnostically assess students' various competency levels, predict different outcomes, and act accordingly in real time. We welcome this wonderful panel that we are so excited to hear tonight. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Keener for her presentation. Thank you all for coming. That's wonderful. Madeline Keener and I'm Some of the work that we've been doing, especially related to Cindy's progress, known as the 
and uh, we work under the umbrella of this large scale assessment. Work on process data and scaling it up. Back insights from research practice tasks in large scale assessment. And the overall heading is goals of large scale assessment are Madeline, we're, we're having a hard time hearing you. Okay. Could you lean into your your microphone maybe a little sure, bit more? Sure, thank you for saying that. Okay. Sure, thank you. So the traditional goals of large scale assessment are to make inferences about what students know and can do. So uh, that's what summative assessment has traditionally about. But increasingly, we're also looking for meaningful reporting uh, about uh, the information like how students are thinking, what processes and strategies they're using to tasks, and how engaged they are. And if we're going to make inferences about these kinds of things, we really need to have information about the process and not just the outcome of the cognitive processes that they are um, using in these assessment tasks. In other words, we need to make the invisible pro cognitive processes visible to us. Um, so in terms of those processes that occur in the mind while students are engaging in these kinds of tasks, or actually any of us are engaging in any mental activity, we have decades of research from uh, cognitive science, from cognitive psychology, um, that which we have a huge amount of information about what's going on in the mind. Of course, these cognitive processes are not directly observable. So, in order for making the invisible visible, cognitive scientists have generated a number of different methodologies. Um, for example, Think Aloud, where uh, we ask people to verbalize their thoughts as they're working through a task. Think Aloud, or sometimes called Talk Aloud, depending on how it's done. Eye, eye tracking is another methodology where we can get this kind of trail, evidence trail of people's thinking as they're working through a task, um, where we can see where they're attending to in an image or a visual display at different moments, and we can make inferences about their attention and their perception and pauses and their thinking and how they're integrating and synthesizing information. And uh, another method for this is to uh, log data of all the um, actions that students do when they are working with digital tasks. So this log of uh, of all of those student interactions and the pauses between their behaviours are, uh, are what are often now called process data. And this kind of data is actually possible to scale up. And that's why large scale assessments are increasingly um, capturing and wanting to use these kinds of data because we scale, we can aggregate it, we can look for patterns, make meaningful and cognitively from this data. So if we think about the traditional way in which data or evidence about students has been um, considered large scale assessment, there has traditionally been this separation. So response data are, have traditionally been um, conceptualized as the kinds of choices that students make in a selective response or their written outputs in a constructed response. And these are the kinds of data that are scored, scaled and reported. Um, uh, in digital tasks, we have many, many other actions. Uh, these uh, data types that are called process data, and they have not for a long time really become part of what we report out on students until recently. And now, of course, the distinction between these two is much more blurred and there are process data 
um, data points that are uh, um, available for us to make inferences about in reporting. So if we think about the notion of having process data, we uh, it's helpful to have a kind of theoretical model of um, these different um, types of process data. So this nested diagram uh, shows a, a kind of layers of the data in the process log. So the orange circle, the outer circle, is represents all of the potentially capturable events and states, state changes and student interactions, causes between them, and a subset of these, of the whole universe of information that we can capture now, um, which is every student interaction, every cause, interactions with the system, with the platform, with individual tasks, navigation between tasks and items, subset of the, all of that universe of, uh, of actions is uh, our actions and causes that are related to the construct. So these are um, identifiable uh, behaviours that we can say a priori are related to the measurement construct of interest. Of those, not all of them will be the kinds of behaviours that we will necessarily score. There are some, for example, if you think of a student doing something like a virtual experiment, um, some of what they are doing in that virtual experiment is construct related, but we wouldn't necessarily score it because we wouldn't score the construct that is for example, if they're running an experiment, we might be interested in the order in which they run trials, might not want to assign a score to that. It still means that it's construct related, but it's not necessarily scorable or scored. Then there is a subset of all of those construct related behaviors that we would score. So this might be, for example, the variables that the student uh, manipulates in that virtual experiment. Know that the construct is evidenced by decisions about um, manipulating and controlling variables, sampling and selecting uh, variables of interest. Those are the kinds of actions that are not only construct related, but they're actually scorable. And we can turn those, we can create a rubric that allows us to score those things. And then a subset of those, this inner circle, innermost circle, uh, are the kinds of actions that are direct responses to explicitly asked questions. So here we might explicitly ask the student, um, why did you choose this variable to control? Or what do you, how do you interpret the results of your uh, experiment? Um, and those are not only scorable, but they are the kind of uh, traditional um, response data that uh, is um, of the type that was available even before the advent of digital assessment. Distinction between these different um, layers in this model of, um, of process data are really based on interpretation. The same here, the same captured event might have a different depending on how you are operationalizing it in terms of the product that you might allocate the score to that, and in other cases, you might not. It gives us a kind of a, um, a model, a theoretical model of uh, the different uses to which score, to which uh, process data can be put, and the, and the ways in which we can think about what our process data can do for us. is also situated, so, um, in terms of what's going on in the student, the cognitive processes are occurring not just in the mind, also in the world. So when we put somebody in front of an interactive representation, that representation has affordances and it um, and it uh, um, generates um, external representation that the student will be using in their thinking. Um, and equally, because it's interactive, um, the way in which we design those affordances are, is really going to impact how the student is thinking and how they're processing the information. Design of the task is really critical, not only to reveal construct relevant information, but also to be 
constraints of human cognition. So in terms of research and practice in digitally based NAEP, I'll just say a few words. The NAEP SAIL, the Survey Assessment Innovations Lab, is funding research projects to inform practice and operational decisions, um, as well as potential innovations for the future. Around questions like, what does calculator mean about math competence? How uh, do um, might responsive tasks, where we give students hints, allow us to make better um, distinctions between how does the layout and the interactive performances of test items impact student thinking? So, for example, here, and I don't think this video is going to work, but let's see, no. Uh, that was an example of a, um, a drag and drop item where uh, we ran experimental manipulations to change the layout and the, design, and the interactive performances. And what we were able to see was that students' strategies and processes heard by us based on a cognitive model, changed according to the, um, the layout and the design and the affordances of uh, So take home thoughts in this kind of large scale oper operational assessment with digital tasks, um, we can uh, gather behavioral data that provides this window important for informing our design decisions and also offers potential for richer and these tasks have to be designed to make them visible and visible. And therefore, I would argue that a cognitive grounding is absolutely critical. Because if this, we can create general affordances that are consistent with uh, human uh, cognitive constraints, design specific interactions, where we force the student to embody or externalize their thinking in a way. And we can then draw out inferences that are meaningful and cognitively valid for reporting. Thank you, Mary. So now uh, we have games. Good evening. Uh, confirming you can hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Parker. Um, so it's great to be here this evening. It's great to virtually uh, see everybody. Um, this evening, I'd like to uh, chat just a bit uh, about some, uh, I think, uh, interesting directions for uh, assessment uh, in maybe the uh, nearish uh, midterm future. Um, I'll be talking about uh, stealth assessment and game based learning. And uh, let's see if we can advance the slide. Uh, Game-based learning environments are um, really fantastic laboratories uh, for studying uh, assessment. So uh, often we think of assessment as being something that um, uh, has a, um, uh, a kind of mechanical uh, sense to it, I guess might be the best word. Um, but we can envision a, a version of assessment uh, that in fact is deeply embedded in uh, game-based learning environments. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about a particular class of game-based learning environments. And uh, by these, I'm referring to narrative-centered learning environments. So uh, narrative is something uh, that really uh, pervades uh, human experience. Um, story is kind of central to who we are uh, as a species. Uh, we're deeply uh, immersed uh, in story-based experiences. Uh, cognitively from episodic memory, uh, but really uh, from a, um, a historical perspective, uh, going back uh, many thousands of years, we have sat around campfires for a long time telling ourselves uh, stories. Um, and now we have the technologies that can really make them uh, create deeply compelling experiences. So uh, narrative-centered learning environments uh, have this potential for promoting engaged learning. Um, and uh, kind of looking forward, uh, there's the possibility that they could improve motivation. Uh, so we all know uh, how important it is to motivate uh, learners, particularly younger learners. Um, and uh, if it were possible to do that, then it might be uh, actually uh, offering the potential 
uh, to improve learning outcomes, not just because of the fact that the uh, experiences are more motivating, uh, but really uh, over time that uh, learners can uh, have a kind of time on task effect by uh, spending more time in the learning environment. So story-based uh, learning environments typically uh, have a couple of characteristics uh, that I think uh, are leverageable. Uh, one of these are believable characters. So uh, imagine a world like uh, we're, we're virtually in uh, right now uh, and kind of like the 10 year from now uh, version of it uh, where uh, characters are uh, autonomously uh, controlled. Uh, so the behaviors of the characters, the uh, speech of the characters, uh, where the characters navigate, uh, how characters are able to uh, interact with other uh, users in the environment, uh, all of that uh, being controlled by uh, state-of-the-art AI. Uh, and then imagine kind of a, a step up from that, uh, a plot controller in an interactive narrative system that's able to uh, manipulate, to orchestrate the behaviors that are going on uh, in that world. Uh, and then finally, imagine the whole narrative experience itself uh, being um, played out in a, a deeply immersive environment, uh, which could be uh, 3D, it could be uh, VR, perhaps there's some AR version of this. Um, and these interactive um, narratives uh, could create these story-based uh, learning experiences uh, that would be have, uh, sort of serving the twin goals of being uh, deeply engaging uh, but also uh, very effective. Uh, you can imagine uh, science-based uh, problem-solving scenarios uh, around this. Uh, and then what we're uh, particularly interested in here in this session is assessment. Um, so the kind of working hypothesis uh, of this line of work uh, is that these kinds of learning environments could really uh, provide the opportunity to create assessments uh, that perhaps might uh, either otherwise not be possible or uh, they might be it might be possible to uh, enact these assessments in ways uh, that are uh, actually deeply motivating uh, and inherently engaging in themselves. That's kind of the assessment piece. And then uh, imagine going forward from that, uh, having a, uh, an ability to deliver feedback uh, and scaffolding that's, that's uh, driven uh, by the assessment models, uh, perhaps in a way uh, that is uh, deeply related to uh, story. So, um, well, uh, now, that, now we've got a learner. A learner is engaged, uh, let's say, with this interactive learning environment, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and you can imagine that um, a, uh, my slide automatically advanced by itself. Uh, you can imagine that the, uh, the, environment is um, instrumented in a way uh, to be able to uh, automatically measure student uh, competencies. Well, um, that would be great. So you could apply sort of a pretest and a post-test. On the other hand, you could machine learn a stealth assessment model uh, that would be embedded in the narrative-centered learning environment and then use this to automatically infer uh, student competencies. Um, this work is very much inspired uh, by work uh, that Val Shute uh, has done over the last uh, decade uh, or so. And I actually think that the next talk uh, has a similar inspiration, uh, as we'll see. Um, and in fact, um, uh, stealth-based assessment uh, is, a, uh, is a general approach, I think, that can work well in many kinds of learning environments. Uh, but I believe it has particular uh, opportunity for um, game-based learning and, uh, and in particular there in uh, story-based learning. So stealth-based assessment and story-based uh, learning environments uh, have this one particular characteristic uh, that I'd like to highlight, which is that uh, if they're successful, um, uh, stealth assessments can be delivered in a way that are fully non-obtrusive, uh, non-intrusive. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, that it could well be the case that uh, immersed in the story uh, learning experience, students are uh, engaging in problem solving actions. Uh, there, for example, let's suppose that it's a science um, uh, mystery. Uh, they are um, uh, engaged in scientific reasoning. It's an inquiry uh, kind of activity. And uh, what's happening kind of in the background is that uh, the students are continuously being uh, assessed. Um, we're going to see that this needn't be for science in particular. Uh, it can work um, uh, for STEM more broadly. Uh, and uh, we'll see a particular uh, learning environment uh, that's focused on computer science. 
So if you could do this, uh, then you could get a, a kind of very, very fine-grained uh, diagnosis of student uh, competencies um, down to the level of uh, very, very uh, granular uh, KSAs, uh, which could support uh, uh, super context-sensitive remediation. Uh, and in particular, uh, as I mentioned before, drive adaptive scaffolding uh, to really make it possible uh, to create tailored learning experiences that are uh, incredibly customized for particular students. Um, I will not go over uh, this particular slide in detail because I believe the next speaker uh, will uh, be describing uh, this, but uh, suffice it to say for now uh, that uh, there are kind of three models that are operating uh, sequentially here, a task model, which represents the task, evidence model, uh, which collects students' learning behaviors, because of course we're collecting fine-grained um, uh, behavior traits data. Uh, it actually could be a little bit broader than that, so as we saw when the, from the last speaker, uh, sometimes we find it's very interesting to collect multimodal data, uh, uh, process data, as she referred to it as, and uh, all of this driving the competency model, uh, which is being able to uh, represent uh, students' knowledge, students' preferences, uh, students' plans, students' goals uh, in a way that um, uh, has very strong uh, predictive power. Now, uh, game-based learning environments uh, have been created for so many different subject matters. Um, this particular one is for middle school computer science education. This is a joint project uh, between um, uh, University of uh, Florida, where our next speaker actually happens to be from, Christy Boyer, who is there, uh, Eric Wiebe, who's one of my colleagues at NC State, and Brad Mott, who's one of my colleagues uh, at NC State. Uh, so for many years now, we've been uh, developing a computer science education environment uh, that actually is crossed between computer science on the one hand uh, and uh, science uh, on the other. And um, the backstory for this is there's an underwater research station uh, that's been taken over by a rogue scientist, and so all the communication uh, at this facility has been lost. And what students have to do is they're sent down uh, to this facility, and they're supposed to investigate the situation. Now, in the course of doing that, uh, they interact with a number of non-player characters uh, who provide scaffolding uh, uh, through block-based uh, programming environments. Uh, uh, in a way that while students are solving block-based uh, programming assignments, uh, they're trying to uh, repair uh, the damage that's been done by this villain, and uh, along the way, uh, they of course get all kinds of uh, support. Uh, they pass through a series of rooms. Uh, there's some really interesting future work here, um, looking at procedural content uh, generation, which we can talk about in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, and really the purpose of it all is to enable them to solve computational uh, thinking challenges, uh, but in a way that's uh, completely story driven. Uh, they uh, create, uh, using this programming interface, some really rich um, uh, programs. I, I think I mentioned this is for middle school students. I'm always amazed at the quality and the capabilities of uh, middle school students uh, for computational thinking. And they solve a number of um, representational challenges dealing with uh, binary uh, and uh, decimal. So this work uh, is, uh, has been going, as I mentioned, for many years. It's ongoing. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've been looking at uh, deep learning-based approaches to um, representing uh, stealth assessment models. It turns out that uh, not only the amount of data, but the type of training uh, that you need very considerably depending on the machine learning approach that you use. Uh, and there are some advantages, uh, particularly if you have access to large data sets for uh, deep learning uh, approaches to self-assessment. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see uh, how all of these kind of um, can, in a rich way, support adaptive scaffolding. Um, and we're particularly interested in um, sort of narrative um, affordances for uh, customizing story-based interactions from this, uh, which I think is going to be uh, super exciting. So I'd like to acknowledge my, uh, my colleagues, uh, and in particular, uh, Uki Min, uh, who has been doing a lot of the work on the uh, stealth-based assessment and the um, uh, deep learning models that support it. Uh, so thanks so much for your attention, and uh, I look forward to Q&A. All right. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Yep. 
Let me walk. Oh, the slides are advancing. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Sayed Ahmad Rahimi, and I'm uh, from the University of Florida. Please let me know if you can hear me well. Yes. Background noise. Yeah, there is a very bad background noise when I start talking. Is that something normal or it's just me? No, it's good, I think. Okay, it went away. All right. How can I go back to the first slide, Diego? There you go. All right, thank you so much. Uh, as I said, my name is Said Ahmed Rahimi, and I'm going to talk about stealth assessment of physics understanding in physics playground. And by now, I think um, with the talks from Maddie and James, you are all ready to hear what I'm uh, going to talk about. So stealth assessment is uh, a, an assessment method that uh, assesses students' uh, understanding of various uh, skills, knowledge, and acquisitions during gameplay or uh, playing or interacting with uh, an immersive learning environment. In this case, we have a game about physics. And uh, you can see the uh, flow chart of the self-assessment here where students are playing with uh, the game and they're uh, creating and generating a lot of uh, performance data and the data is getting uh, captured in the log files and automatically assessed and analyzed using the self-assessment machinery and then that assessment is fed back to the student model and we can make claims and understand what is the, the understanding or the level of uh, the skill of the student at any given uh, moment in time uh, in real time in an ongoing unobtrusive uh, way and then by that information we can make changes uh, to the game for example we can make uh, the next level that the student plays uh, more difficult or less difficult, depending on their level of physics understanding or any other construct that we want to measure. Um, also, we can provide different feedback for the students to uh, personalize their learning experience. And this loop can go on and on. The more students play with the environment, the more accurate their, uh, the assessment uh, will become. And by, by doing this and using self-assessment method, we can blur the boundaries between learning and assessment. Traditionally, students had to go through this cycle of teaching, stop, testing, stop, teaching, and go on. So that stop moments are the moments that are kind of wasted. But if students are playing, learning, and at the same time under the hood are getting assessed, they can uh, uh, learn faster, better, and that's uh, uh, what we are hoping for. Um, so far, we have been uh, assessing a lot of constructs. Uh, these are the list uh, that I could think of. Um, physics understanding, calculus, creativity, persistence, problem solving, assistance, thinking. And you see like, for example, creativity, it's very hard to measure, but these type of uh, methods allow for measuring hard to measure constructs, some constructs like creativity. A stealth assessment uses ECD, which is uh, called Evidence-Centered Design Framework Assessment. Uh, people at ETS know ECD very well because it's uh, started from there by the work of Bob Mislevy and Russell Almond uh, and other people. Uh, so ECD has three main uh, models that James talked about a little bit. Uh, starting from the left competency model, we first identify and operationalize what is it that we want to measure. In this case, think about physics understanding. What do we mean by physics understanding? And we need to just uh, come up with the sub competencies of physics understanding with the help of the experts of physics uh, knowledge in whatever grade it is that we want to uh, assess physics understanding. And then in the evidence model, we come up with the indicators that can provide some evidence for something that we cannot see. Physics understanding is unobservable, but if someone plays with a lever or a pendulum or a springboard in a way that they show that they have a knowledge of, for example, Newton's third law, we can make a claim that this student knows what Newton's third law is. So evidence model has two important components, evidence uh, rules, 
in which we come up with the rules that the, the system can identify the observables uh, from all of those log data that uh, come into the system. And then some statistical models. In, the, in this case, we use Bayesian networks to connect those observables that we can collect from the log data uh, to the uh, uh, SOP competencies and in general to the competency model. And this process can uh, go over and over uh, until we have uh, an accurate assessment of the student's level of understanding. Finally, the task model specifies the task features. In this case, we have game levels. Uh, for example, the task difficulty, game difficulty, and uh, any other uh, specifications that can provide and elicit the evidence that we need for the evidence model. So from left to right, you can design your assessment. And from right to left, you can get diagnostic inferences. So in general, there are three key elements for stealth assessment. We need to have a technology-rich environment. For example, a digital game, ECD should be used to design and develop a stealth assessment in that environment. And finally, uh, to close the loop, we need to do something using this information that we are collecting and assessing students' understanding uh, of any given construct by providing feedback and uh, making it a formative assessment. So in general, when we think about assessment, we should keep in mind that assessment uh, is different than test and measurement. Assessment is uh, simply getting uh, a lot of information from different uh, uh, you know, uh, sources in order to uh, understand what is going on with the student at that moment to do something about it. The next step after improve, uh, provide, uh, getting those information and understanding students' level of understanding or uh, uh, you know, level of uh, that skill that we are trying to measure is very important. We will not stop at that point. We will do something after that point. And that's what makes uh, self-assessment uh, special. So I hope you can see this video. And if you can type in the chat that you're seeing uh, at least the intro of the video. And when I click, um, you see the video, that would be great. Do you see the video playing? OK, good. So this is Physics Playground, a game that uh, we have been developing. And uh, in this game, we have a self-assessment of physics understanding. We have different type of game levels. And in this case, you're seeing the type of game level of uh, sketching. Uh, when students draw objects on the screen, they can create different uh, physics machines and they can hit a red balloon using a green ball. And that's what the, uh, this video is showing if you don't see the video. I'm, Clicking on the play and let me know if you if you see it. Mm, okay, so let me do something else. I will copy and paste the link of the video to presentation board and let me know if you can see it now. Okay. This is a type of uh, game level, we, we call it manipulation levels, where students need to only manipulate some uh, sliders, for example, mass, gravity, or air resistance in order to solve a game level. They cannot draw any objects in these type of game levels.
Perfect. Um, so we have uh, about 120 game levels that we created using a tool that we uh, developed uh, for uh, creating game levels. Let me proceed to the slide that I stop sharing my slides. Perfect. So this is the competency model. Speaking from the ECD language, this is the competency model that we created. We actually created two types of competency model and we showed those two competency models to our physics experts in our team, and they identified this one as the one which is closer to what we need to have with all these connections between the sub facets. So if you want to measure physics understanding in ninth through 11th grade, uh, this is the competency model for that. Then we used this tool called QMetrics, which shows the levels that we have and the competencies that we have. And then wherever you see a one, if you actually can see this, um, that means that competency model is the primary competency or uh, skill or knowledge behind that game level. If it's a two, that means that's a secondary uh, competency model linked to that game level. We also had two types of game difficulty. Uh, um, uh, indexes. Um, so one is game mechanics difficulty. The other one is uh, physics understanding difficulty. Uh, from one to five, we gave each game level uh, a number, a score, and then we added those two together to create a composite difficulty in order to show the next level to the students according to uh, uh, their level of understanding of physics in any um, moment in time in the game. Here's an example of a game level called Florida. Uh, where students have to uh, change those um, um, sliders in order to solve the game level. And these are the four observables that we came up with for this game level. Sliders, whether or not they uh, are trying the right slider in this game level, solving the level, if they solve the level or not, they would get uh, some scores for that. And checking the bounciness, that's the option that can show that students know that this game level is about Newton's third law. If they spend like five, six minutes into the, to the game without checking that checkbox that shows that they actually don't know this game level is about Newton's third law. And finally, the number of sliders adjust, adjustments. You see that this game level has information for Newton's third and uh, Newton's third law and energy can uh, dissipate. But Newton's third law was the primary concept of this uh, game level. In order to make the uh, self-assessment in physics play playground possible, this is the architecture of physics playground. We have two servers that on the left, we have the, the game engine with all of the uh, logging information, um, um, authentication, and the database for the students. Uh, username and the database for the game levels and so on, and the game engine itself. Students log into the game and they have the, the, the game levels in front of, front of them. They start playing with the game and they generate all those um, data into the learning locker MongoDB database that we have uh, in, in, on our server. And uh, we filter through those log data to just pick those uh, information that we need. And finally, using uh, two important processes we identify the evidence and then we accumulate the evidence into the student model. And then it goes back to the game engine by the post re request that you see on the bottom of the screen. And in those two orange boxes, we can do something in the game. For example, change the next uh, level uh, uh, in terms of the uh, student's understanding or show them uh, their uh, physics understanding uh, scores or level as you can see, level of mastery. And you can see those nine competencies that I showed you earlier. And there is a bar at the bottom of uh, the screen for the overall physics understanding. Students are also can see their progress, how many levels they solved, how many coins they're collected, and how much money they have in their bank. Uh, we uh, published our findings for this study. Um, actually, this work has been done um, at Florida State University. And uh, Dr. Shute, my advisor, uh, has been the lead on this work. If you want, you can just scan that uh, QR code and, or search for this uh, uh, paper. I can talk more about our findings if you are interested. And finally, let me a shout out to the team that worked on this project, uh, Dr. Shoot as the PI and the other great team members that you can see on the screen. With that, I will stop talking and hand it to Diego.
Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad. Um, can you see my slides now? Yes. Oh, I don't see them, <laughs> but okay, perfect. I can see them now. Today, I'm going to talk about the personalized caring, caring assessments in technology rich environments. Um, first, uh, I'm going to provide some information about general trends in assessments, describe what we, I mean by caring assessments, and then some examples uh, based on the work on conversation based assessments and some uh, information about challenges and future work. So, uh, as the presenters have mentioned, we have we, we see uh, the attention increasing in terms of the expansion of, or, or the the context that uh, how assessment is 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 being thought as as a a, a way of as a understanding what people are doing in different contexts but being able to provide feedback and create situations that are, uh, are learning situations in environments that provide uh, naturalistic uh, and uh, situations that are interesting for, for users, for students. So there is, uh, we, in, we, we have seen assessments that are, uh, that are, uh, combining or integrating uh, information in terms of formative versus summative or they can they are able to create uh, situations where people can actually learn or, or understand what people are doing while engaging in really interesting and uh, activities so uh, there is a trend for for looking at these environments that provide that are really close to learning uh, situations and they use process and response data. So what is personalized in assessments? In this um, approach, we take into account more information about the learner, cognitive, non-cognitive aspects of the learner, learner and also information about the learning context. So we can create those situations that students find engaging and at the same time collect uh, valid and reliable evidence of students' skills, uh, knowledge and abilities. Uh, and graphically, you can see the idea here that the student is in a particular context. He, the student uh, may have uh, situations in, uh, constraints and things in life and things that about the context that sometimes teachers know but the assessment system doesn't know so the more we know about the student the better the kinds of interactions we can create and the more appropriate those interactions would be so there are situations where we can think about in, uh, and, and create um, um, environments that take into account those particular aspects of the learner. Some use cases, for example, if the student is not motivated to take the test, the uh, a possible approach would be to, to provide information about why it is, it is important to take the test or just offer other options to the student or just take into account that the student was not motivated when interacting with those activities. In another case, that has to do with opportunities to learn. If we know that that's the case, the, we could offer students a, approach, a, a different, different resources or, or for the teacher so they can learn before asking them many questions about something that they don't know. As well, uh, we could take into account those uh, uh, issues when, when understanding, when aggregating that evidence that we can collect using these environments. So in this area, we have been doing some work on understanding emotions in, in assessments by to work with Blair Lehman, where we under, we were able to identify a subset of emotions 
that play a role when people are taking assessments, especially those conversation-based assessments that I'm going to show you later on. Um, and those that's important because we can identify what emotions and the intensity of those emotions so we can react or the system can react accordingly. Also work on, on taking into account individual dif differences, individual differences in assessments. Well, this is work with Jesse Sparks, where we analyze how different aspects of the learner play a role when they interact with these environments, how they answer these questions, how they interact with these agents based on some of those individual differences. And that has to do with uh, making sure we create safe environments for people to actually answer the questions and they feel that they can actually uh, interact with these environments. Uh, and there is research on cognitive bandwidth and recovery strategies so we can facilitate, we can create those environments for to be able to demonstrate what they know or can do. So in terms of conversation assessments, these are conversations with computer-based characters and these are adaptive. So the, these are short, com short conversations where people type or say things and the computer reacts to what the, the computer reacts to what the student uh, says. And we can give students multiple opportunities to elaborate. We can ask them for explanations and and ask them again if they didn't elaborate or if we if the system needs more information. Uh, so trying to create those conversations to gather additional evidence about the student, and those can be embedded in in simulation, scenario-based systems, game-based assessments. In one of those, uh, we, we have created several of these, and some are for assessing science inquiry skills. And in those cases, we created conversations within the interaction, within the environment. Some were to introduce the agents, some were, some were aimed at uh, just getting additional information about why a particular student selected a particular piece of evidence for to make a prediction. And we were able to assign uh, partial credit based on that additional evidence that we got through these conversations with these characters. We have done work with isomorphic tasks, and this is work by Lei Liu and other people at DTS, where we could reuse many of the aspects, many of the components, graphical components, and also conversations to explore scalability issues, comparability, generalizability issues. So we had two similar environments. One was about predicting a volcano eruption, and the other one was about predicting a severe thunderstorm. and work on using these conversations to assess English language learning skills. And in this particular example, the students were engaging, were interacting with other students and working on, a, on an assignment in a collaborative way. And they, through this interaction, uh, we were able to identify if there were any issues with the language uh, or, or the math concept. So, we were able to scaffold the language aspects to later assess math uh, concepts. And that was really useful to, to create situations uh, where we could identify what, what words were difficult for people to understand before uh, actually solving the problem. So in terms of challenges and future work, we have uh, to create situations and we need data and since we need data we need to worry about privacy and security so those communication channels uh, need to be created and being able to uh, capture some of that information about context is not easy but it is important to to make it in a way that people can uh, own their own data and they can provide permission for particular uses and so that's one of the big challenges. Another challenge is uh, creating situations that are appropriate. So co-designing these environments to create tasks that are fair so people can actually 
demonstrate what they can do. So going beyond accessibility, but in terms of uh, caring about what people know or, or the situations where they are, in which cases the system has to provide additional time or the system has to, the assessment system has to uh, understand uh, emotions and, and create uh, situations for people to be able to provide evidence in a, or to answer questions in ways that, that make sense. The appropriate use of, use of assessment information is through uh, create to, through evaluating those reporting or dashboards in terms of uh, what people want to see, like uh, what they prefer to see, but also do they understand the data that is being provided to them and do they make the right decisions based on that data. So it is more than just preference, it is more than just putting lots of data on the screen, it is about making sure that people, we can inform people about what's going on to make decisions at the right level. And finally, providing information about how these systems work so people can trust these types of systems. That's another challenge, communicating how adaptive systems work so they understand how the data is used and they can adopt this also people benefit from, from these environments uh, as ex it is expected. And with that, I will open it to the question answer period. We just have for, uh, like three or four minutes for questions and um, please type your questions or ask questions for any of the presenters. Thank you. Jonathan, you had an interesting comment. Do you want to make that comment to the group? I I don't hear the uh, is anyone asking questions right now. Do you want to type the questions? We can see the chat. I can respond to the uh, the narrative question. Um, it's actually a, a really curious uh, question for a number of reasons, and I would say no nobody uh, knows the answer to this. Um, one of the um, uh, one of the sort of hypotheses to explore. Um, is how uh, simple can a narrative be uh, and still have these engaging uh, properties to it? Um, so the, the great uh, example of this is the comic strip. Uh, so comic strips that can be incredibly simple and yet uh, amazingly engaging. Um, and in fact, there are people who are looking at uh, comic strips, sort of 2D uh, graphics uh, for um, education. Um, you can imagine shifting that to 3D, and you can imagine uh, shifting it to longer uh, periods of time. Uh, you can imagine expanding the cast of characters. Um, but in general, uh, it seems pretty likely that there's some uh, kind of um, simplicity uh, goal that we would want to strive for here. Uh, if for no other reason that then um, resources, learning resources are scarce. Uh, the time that students have to spend is scarce. Uh, the time uh, that uh, designers have to create it uh, is scarce. Um, and so in general, uh, kind of trying to figure out what's the sweet spot of uh, what creates the most engaging and effective experiences and yet uh, kind of minimizes along uh, all of these dimensions. Super, super interesting to think about. Responses in the chat, Dr. Lester, about that. Um, and I think we might have to move to our next session in just a moment because um, our presenter is about ready to step forward, I believe. But I would love everyone to you know, add your comments to the chat, please, for the panel. And we'll try to copy the chat and respond to your questions writing while we get ready for our next presenter who is um, Dr. Mina Johnson-Glenberg, and I believe um, Dr. 
Johnson, you can step up and we should give this um, panel a round of applause. to Thank also you. end the live stream. My, the main event has finished. We're going to stick around for a few minutes as we change over to a new presenter, but the live stream will now close. Thank you again to our videographers, Tony Cube Studios and YouTube audience. Go ahead and end the